Merrimack Street was busy. It was just a bustling place, it really was. I have very vivid memories of downtown Haverhill. Um, my grandmother would bring me all the time to shop, and if, if we would go to these um, little breakfast places or coffee places. The downtown at that time was really a vibrant place to be. There were throngs of people, and during lunch hour, people would just come out of those shoe shops like ants, and they would go downtown. And it must have been great for the merchants down there because there were throngs of people all the time. Lots of communities in New England, particularly mill towns, a large portion of the workforce lived within walking distance or wherever the mills were, and most mill cities, a lot of the mills are right near the downtown. They might be one street over from the main commercial district. And a lot of that obviously is done because people who were working in the mills in the early 20th century didn't have a car. So worker housing was near the downtown, the mills were near what became the commercial district, and people ordinarily would do all their shopping that way as well. Nobody had big refrigerators and freezers, and so people would go to the market every couple of days, people would pick up what they needed, consume it, then go out a couple of days later and pick it up again. And a lot of downtown commercial areas grew up just because that was the rhythm of daily life. People went downtown almost weekly to see what was around, to see uh, what was on sale. Or it was a, a meeting place, really. Whatever you needed was downtown because that's the way America was in those days. Everything was geared towards the downtown. Actually, Merrimack Street was the center of our, our thinking and uh, visiting and everything was downtown. Going down with my mother, well, I mean, we'd make, in a, a sense, sometimes a day of it, you know, you'd have, you'd pay the bills and you'd have lunch down there, and uh, because it was local people who were working in the store, I, my mother was someone who knew everyone, and so, you know, you'd wander through the stores and stop and talk to the clerks, and, you know. There was just so much to do down there. It was, it was bubbly, busy. If you were looking for something, you'd find it downtown, whatever it was furniture, jewelry, drug stores, so there was always something. I owned a behavioral national bank, of course, they uh, still had the post office there. Um, Kennedy Butter and Egg, Colonial Theater, uh, Haverhill Gazette's office was there. You had the, um, I think both the electric and the gas company had um, stores down there. Barrett's was there, Mitchell's was there, Corellis Jewelers. Um, Siva Spears that became Park Snow, W.T. Grants, uh, Newbury's, which was another uh, five and dime store, Lemkins, Woolworths. We would just go down for just took it every Sunday afternoon if we had nothing to do. We'd go down and walk on Merrimack Street. It was just a place to go that everybody would see each other. Stores weren't open though on Sunday. No, but we'd no. still go down yeah. and, and yeah. shop around and go to the yeah. movies. Do, uh, uh, what do they call it, window shopping. We just walked. Nobody yeah. had cars. There was an energy and a vibrancy. Um, it was an exciting place to live. I mean, people from Groveland and New Hampshire would all come to Haverhill to do their shopping. It was the place to come. It was an opportunity to get out and see what's going on. I remember a lot of the people came down on Saturday nights. They, they'd come down in a bus to shop Saturdays. Every Saturday you'd see people, oh, people from New know. Hampshire that would come down. People particularly from southern New Hampshire would come in because remember this is before the day of uh, you know Rockingham Mall and this sort of thing. It was only a couple of stops on the train. Yeah, certainly southern New Hampshire. Um, it, they, people really had no choices. We were the big city for, for that area. One of my favorites, Pentucket Shoe Store, because they had an x-ray machine. And even though we didn't know, of course, it was dangerous in those days, but the big fun was to, you know, see your feet and see where they, you know, actually came in the, in the shoes. So this was 
this was the big tree. Right up until, until they closed, I, I, I shopped at Barrett's Men's Shop for years and years and years, and it was a really good men's shop. I mean, I, even when I lived in Boston and I'd do some, came, some shopping over in Cambridge and places like that, uh, I, to me, it was just, uh, Barrett's was just uh, as good as anything you could find in Boston. Oh, oh, Kennedy's, the butter and egg store, that's what, <laughs> that was called. My mother always went to Kennedy's, and most of uh, all my friends. I'll tell you, I can remember my mother taking me down, it was very common, taking me downtown Haverhill to Kennedy's Egg and Butter store at about 8 o'clock in the morning and putting me in line. This is during World War II. And I would, uh, I'd stay there probably, to me it seemed like I was there forever. They probably, I was there for probably a half an hour. And then one of my sisters would come down and get in line. And then another sister would relieve her until finally they opened up. And they, they'd only do that when there was a sale going on for something like butter, which was very rare to get. You didn't have butter in World War II. And uh, so that was, that was my first remembrance of downtown. Remember Mohegan's, Mo yeah. yeah. the grocery store? You'd yeah. go down yeah. Friday night and get all the delicious yeah. desserts. My father and mother used to go from the, the Merrimack line, take the uh, trolley, go up and shop at Mohegan's yeah. and bring all the groceries for yeah. the week because there was f uh, six of us. See, bread was eight cents, a loaf of bread. Hamburg was 25 cents and Mohegan carried all yeah. those things. I guess most time probably was spent in Mitchell's and Mitchell's was the store that had the big candy counter when you walked in. Um, it had tubes that if you bought something, everything flowed around the building to the business area. And they had this amazing system where you, the clerk would take your money and put it in a little tube, and then the tube would go in some kind of a vacuum system, and it would be sucked up to the office where they would make change, give you a receipt, and send it back down. It ran all along the ceiling, all these brass pipes, which were, I thought, beautiful. I mean, it was, if you looked up, you just saw all this um, system going on. So you would, person would make out a slip, put it in this little car that we called it, and it came up to the office and they made, made the change. So the clerk didn't have to do that. When I was in high school and so forth, we'd go down to Mitchell's and go downstairs. And then downstairs there was a uh, cobbler and we'd go back and then we used to have taps put on our shoes because you, you didn't have many pairs of shoes. So you want to keep the leather. So we'd go back there and they put these metal taps on and you could walk through Havel High School and it would sound like there was a bunch of Gene Kellys walking along. We used to go to the record department downstairs. And they had restrooms downstairs where you put your money in and there was a lady in there that watched to make sure someone didn't go in behind you. And, the shoe shop and the big bubble gum machine was at the bottom of um, the stairs. And uh, the phone booth, we used to use the phone booth to call home to see if we could charge something. Usually that was a no. It was a, a one-stop shopping store. And um, it, was, it was a big draw. Mitchell's was a big draw for Haverhill. Talk to anybody grew up in the, in the 60s, 50s and 60s, actually, in downtown Havel, and they all spent time in uh, Mitchell's. And I loved going down there. That was just a, it was like cheers. Everybody knew your name. Downtown was, uh, the shopping area was mostly concentrated from the post office all the way down to White's Corner, and that's where the Woolworth building was. Um, I remember the hole they dug for the Woolworth building. My mother took me downtown when I was maybe, I don't know, six or seven, and um, we saw the big bulldozers in there digging the hole for the, for the uh, cellar for the uh, Woolworth building. Oh, sure, I have memories of Woolworths. Yes, every, everybody went to Woolworths and having lunch um, at the lunch counter. That was... Um, that was a big deal. I think, I think my folks let us <laughs> walk downtown, probably maybe the seventh grade. I don't really remember what grade I was in, 
but that was a big deal. We'd walk down and have lunch at the Woolworth counter. Woolworth was the biggest dime store that people had ever seen. It, it, it was huge. We were talking uh, about the lunch counter that they had. It ran almost the whole length of the store. They had uh, sodas and ice creams and things like that, but you could also get sandwiches at the lunch counter, just like um, you see in old time movies. And um, people would go there, it would be a destination. People would go there. Well, of course, everyone talks about the soda fountain and how great the soda fountain was. Uh, we never had a lot of money, so we really did not frequent the soda fountain at Woolworths. But which I would look at that soda fountain and I would think how wonderful it would be to just walk up to that soda fountain and to order a Coke or order something at the soda fountain. But um, as far as what was there, it seems to me that just about everything was there. The fish supplies, uh, one could buy shades, window shades down there, have them cut. My, all of our makeup, and of course our first lipstick came from Woolworths. I yeah. bought my first lipstick in Woolworths, <laughs> and I remember the day very clearly. Yeah. <laughs> seventh grade, uh, my best girlfriend and I <laughs> walked downtown, and we both bought a lipstick. But we hid it, we didn't tell our mothers. I remember buying an address, small black book for 10 cents. And I, was, <laughs> I wasn't even dating girls yet. I didn't know why, why I bought it, but it was to uh, keep track of whatever I was doing at eight or nine years old. Woolworths had these little, pla little bins. They weren't plastic, they were glass dividers. And you could get, oh, the, we called it the Chinese finger torture, that you'd put your fingers in, little things like that, even yo-yos or tops. Uh, kids' toys that were not expensive, that would keep you occupied for hours, and Woolworths had a lot of that as well as the other uh, the other sections. And then, of course, they had their um, counter where you could get a hot dog and a coke for probably all of forty-five cents. So if you had a few dollars in your pocket, that's all you needed. After school, we would go downtown. We would go to the Woolworth building, go to the uh, soda fountain get a soda there. The thing I remember the most is the soda fountain. Sitting there, thinking we were a big deal, sitting at the soda fountain, having a, a black and white soda, which would be chocolate and vanilla. So it was really, really, really fun. And at Christmas time, I don't think we were more than 10 or 11 years old, we'd walk over town to buy a gift for our parents, and we'd go to Woolworths, because where were you gonna go with, you know, a dollar or two dollars, whatever we had. I can remember doing my Christmas shopping there and buying my mother evening in Paris perfume and little tiny dolls for my friends. It was just a very neat store. So you could go in there with two dollars and come out with all your Christmas shopping done. So it was really neat. And I remember specifically being at the snack bar, having lime rickies. And I remember that um, behind, somehow behind the food area, they had goldfish and birds and the birds would escape from the cages and they would be flying around the store. And occasionally the uh, canaries and the parakeets would escape and you'd have them flying wildly, you know, over, as you know, we were there almost, uh, no, 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 please don't mess on the, you know, things like curtains and, you know, all sorts of other things like this. Well, Woolworths was the first time that I was working um, in a store, I just turned um, 16 in December and so I, I went in and I uh, got a job there for the for the Christmas rush knowing it was only going to be for a short period of time but they they put me um, on the uh, lunch counter and uh, I lasted on that about one lunch hour rush I just couldn't keep up with the uh, so I, I went and said, you know, I'm going to quit. So they, they were kind. They put me in the domestics department, and I, I fit in there much better. Um, the, uh, the office, I believe, was on the right-hand side, you know, down, down a little hall. And as I remember, we had to go down into the, uh, the basement, the lower level, in order to uh, clock in. You had one of the old-fashioned machines where you, you know, press the time thing, and they, you know, they stamped it for that. 
One of my distinct memories was walking over the bridge with Bert and his brother David, my brother Joe, I think the four of us. The Beatles had just come out. Bert didn't have enough money to buy introducing the Beatles or meet the Beatles, so we're in Woolworths and he bought a album called Beetle Beat by the Bugs. <laughs> and it was horrible music, but that was the best he could do. And I remember going in there, looking at the albums because they sold records as well. And that's where uh, Bert bought his first Beatle album. There were other, you know, Grant's I think was the name of the store and J.J. Newberry's. There were many similar stores, but Woolworths is the one that was the, the focal point. Yeah, Woolworths was just a nice memory. They had everything. We spent a lot of time in downtown Haverhill, especially the high school years, because our high school was located um, almost in the downtown area. And a lot of the kids would have jobs after school in downtown Haverhill, uh, part-time jobs. And uh, Saturday was a big day to go downtown and meet everybody and say hi and, and have ice cream and stuff like that. As we got older, when I was in high school, on Friday nights, teenagers gathered downtown. You know, Merrimack Street was a very busy place. And every afternoon, what we would do is we would go down to the Mayfair Tea Room and we would have our Coke and our French fries down there. We had, uh, we had a wonderful time at uh, the Mayfair Tea Room and not sure that the proprietors of the Mafia Tea Room appreciated the, the high school students. Um, but nevertheless, we were their customers. We were regulars. We came in there every afternoon. We stayed there and spent whatever money we had. And uh, it, it was good for everybody. It was good for the proprietors and it was good for us also. We had a place to meet. You talk about recreation. Downey Donut Shop, which is next to the gas company. That was uh, after school, that's where all the ladies went to have get Cokes. So all the gentlemen followed them down there. As we got older, particularly in those middle school years, um, there was a place downtown called Ken's Hobby Shop. And the rage then was um, track automobiles, little cars that ran on tracks. And Ken had a big layout down there, and kids would come out with their little cars and put them on the track and grab the uh, device that would speed them up and slow them down and race them down there. So Ken's Hobby Shop, that was a very popular place for kids. Later on in my high school years, I used to be dropped off on a Saturday. All the kids would go down on Saturday. There always were things that were kind of a coffee shop that were hangouts for kids. In my day, it was the TikTok. Uh, I think before that, it was probably the Puritan that people were, uh, went into. And um, it, it was so busy at some time that they'd, uh, they'd be shoving people out, you know, they'd make sure that as soon as you took that last bite, you were out the door. We would go to the beach in the summer and we'd try to see who had the best tan. And we'd go down Saturday night when we come home from the week, stay at the beach, and wear the whitest dress we could have, so we'd show the tan up the most, and we'd all try to outdo each other, the group that I knew, to have the best tan, to go down a Merrimack Street, show it off. <laughs> Hardly anyone really went to the book department, but they had a book department too. But Saturdays we went to the record department at Mitchell's and maybe tried on hats at Park Snow's. It was beautiful in there though. It had a beautiful staircase and when you got to the top of the staircase, there were hundreds of hats to try on. And for some reason, we all went up and tried on hats and the ladies would not like so much when we did that, but because obviously we never really bought the hats. Uh, one of the things that I remember, and it was when I was a little kid, I guess, of course, the high school was up, right up on the hill on my, Main Street. And um, on Saturday afternoons, you'd see a, str a stream of kids who'd be walking down to the, the stadium in Riverside. And it must have been for a homecoming game or a Thanksgiving Day game or something. I can remember whether it was the girls or the cheerleaders or whatever having... Um, chrysanthemum corsages, and I just thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. 
we would en masse walk down Water Street from the stadium when the game got out and then everyone would go downtown and go to um, Tuscarora was one of the coffee shops or, or the TikTok and you would just go there and hang, hang with your friends and have fun and it, it cost like 50 cents. But it was really nice and those football games were amazing because I can still envision walking down Lincoln Street and um, Water Street with all my friends, like hundreds of kids just leaving and walking because no one had a car. You know, we were all like 14 and it was just a fun thing to do on a beautiful fall day. My twin brother Joe worked at Barrett's store and we were twins so we were easily confused in those days. And so I'd go downtown and he'd be working in the store and pick up something for uh, Christmas whenever it was at the time. But you'd go into that store and you knew everybody was there. It was really a nice feeling. It was almost like a place. We weren't supposed to hang out there, but we did because my friends were working there as well. In some of the other stores, you'd, you'd go in and there were friends of yours from high school working there, so you'd go in and hang out until somebody would say, it's time to leave. My father did pharmacy there and, and uh, man, it was a store manager. And uh, we worked there. I worked a worker's permit. My sisters and I, when we were 14, and worked on the cigarette counter uh, when you first walked in the store. Beautiful girls worked there and all the fellows used to hang around down, down there at, <laughs> at the cleaning business. So I, I worked summers and I worked weekends during the school year at Mitchell's department store. And when I was about 14 years old, um, Chester Thayer, who was the um, floor walker was what they called him at the time. And he knocked on our door one night and he said, uh, would you like a job, Anita? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know, what would it be? And he said, well, he said, I need someone on weekends on the chocolate aisle. So I went in there and I shoveled chocolates for all while I was in high school, as a matter of fact. And right next to the left was the jewelry counter in Mitchell's. And oh, I loved that jewelry counter. And I would go and sneak off and look at what they had for jewelry. Well, we came downtown. I can remember as a kid, we went to the movies. <laughs> Picked up the Saturday afternoon matinees. <laughs> You no, know, we, we at that time downtown Haverhill had uh, plenty of uh, uh, theaters. There was the Lafayette, the Strand, the Colonial, and the Paramount. They used to go to the movies uh, at ten cents. All movies, and you saw the main movie, the second movie, the comic strip, and the news. It, you were there practically all day doing that, and it was. It, and then besides that, sometimes when you went to the Strand and you'd get a dish or you'd get a glass and you'd get a, end up having a, a set of dishes on top of just being 10 cents. <laughs> I can remember taking my little sister, my sister Claire. She was four years younger than me, so I was probably about, she was probably about five and I was nine. I took her down to the Paramount Theater, you know, probably about one o'clock. And I never forget the movie was San Francisco with Spencer Tracy and Clark Gable. It was the uh, earthquake. And I just was absolutely thought that was the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. So I decided, said to my little sister Claire, want to stay for see it again? Yes. Now we're talking when the, the seven o'clock at night. And the man that the, the manager at the Paramount was Mr. Coburn. And uh, all of a sudden I'm watching a movie and there's this flashlight and I said, Hugh? And I said, yes, yes. Mr. Coburn was the manager. He was God in that theater. He said, you better come with me and bring your little sister. He says, when he got me outside, he said, you better get home, your mother's the <laughs> And I can remember that so clear. Uh, it's a memory that our family, you know, talks about and enjoys. There's no TV, and um, there was very little at home for entertainment. 
so everyone was going to the movies. There was no, um, there was no air conditioning. So we would go to the Strand Theater and they had air, well, the first ones to have air conditioning. The Paramount was an elegant theater and that was the prettiest one. We graduated from the uh, Paramount Theater. We were the last ones, weren't we? And uh, they had a beautiful organ in that theater. And uh, the, the uh, boy that graduated with us, Donald Stewart, he played the organ and he just ragged everything. <laughs> we got the biggest kick out of that, especially when we were just practicing. And then when uh, the day came and we graduated, he was, did a good job playing. The Paramount Theater was very beautiful. Um, lots of gilded gold when you walked in and um, mirrors. It was a beautiful theater. The Colonial was also ornate. They had the red velvet roping as you went in there. I remember seeing the movie The Parent Trap with Haley Mills there and a few other films. There were two nice theaters downtown with balconies and plush seating, crushed velvet seats. So I remember them and sitting there on uh, you know, an afternoon watching something on the big screen. It was a throwback to the 30s and 40s. These cities all had locally owned independent movie theaters and people would flock to the downtowns on the weekend. Kids would go on a Saturday afternoon, cheap money, three cartoons, two movies, and your parents would just drop you off. I mean, my parents did, to, did this to me all the time. It was a safe community space. Everybody knew each other, everybody looked out for each other. So if you think on a Friday and Saturday night, if the f there's four theaters, and let's say they each hypothetically hold 300 people, and they're pretty full, that's like 1,200 bodies coming into the downtown to go to the movies. And some percentage of them are gonna do something before and or after with money. They're gonna eat, they're gonna drink, they're gonna do something else. Right? And then, say, 40 weeks, of, 40 weeks of the year, take that money away from the downtown. That's huge. I mean, that's devastating to all the, all the businesses around, you know, around that establishment. My Haverhill um, involved a lot of the downtown because um, that was where everything took place. Um, that was where we, where we gathered in Washington Square uh, at the end of World War II. Um, that was where all of the parades were. I think probably one of the things I can remember was they had the tourist centenary in Haverhill. Haverhill was founded in 1640, mm -hmm. so this was 1940, it was the 300th anniversary. And I can remember it was a parade, it's the first parade I'd ever seen in my life but I can't remember, but I do remember one stick, thing sticks out of my mind. This great, big, huge policeman on a motorcycle riding along beside the parade, and he reached down and pushed me back. I guess I was so excited, I was leaning up. Mary get back, and I was like, and, and at my old age now today, I remember that so clear. Yeah, they had a regular parade, and we had some darn good parades, especially during the war. But when it was all patriotic, they'd go through downtown, on South Main Street in Bradford. There were big parades. As far as the music, both the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, they all had top-notch bands. <laughs> and I mean, they were top-notch. I still, to this day, when there's a parade going by, I, I get chills, you know, I just, it's, it's sort of nice to see the parade. Sometimes I get tears in my eyes, Still, it, because it's so nice, it's all people from the Haverhill in their downtown, and it's the, it, it included Merrimack Street and all the things like that, you know. The Christmas parade went right down Merrimack Street, and as I recall, my mother took me upstairs in, in um, Siva Spears, because they had a big window that overlooked Merrimack Street, and um, we watched the parade from upstairs and we saw Santa Claus go by and everything. And that, that was um, pretty impressive for a kid. Downtown Haver was magical at Christmas. It re really was magical for a kid at Christmas. The lights strung back and forth across the street, um, all different colored lights. In uh, 
uh, Washington Square, you had uh, a bell that, as I remember, played uh, music and you know, carols and things like this, which I suppose after a while probably drove the people who worked there full time nuts. Nobody had a car in those days, so you rode the bus. And I remember one time um, my mother and I were on the bus to go home and it got stuck in the square. And we heard every Christmas song about 50 times. My mother um, was beside herself, but it was magical for kids. It really, it really was a, a wonderful time. Certainly they had uh, the, the biggest and the best that they, you know, that they could bring in to those, to those stores because everybody did go down there to do the, the bulk of their Christmas shopping. Christmas shopping. I remember telling people I could go downtown probably with about $12 in my pocket and buy for everybody in my family, and that's six brothers and sisters, my mother and father and my grandparents, because prices weren't outrageous. And downtown in those days during Christmas was bustling. No matter what the weather was, people were out walking, seemed nice. There were actually police officers directing traffic, letting you cross the street. It was a different world, totally different world that people can't even imagine today, but there was a bit of an excitement back in that era. At the snow, rain, or anything of that, the street was always busy. And the sidewalks were jam-packed with people. I mean, you literally, you know, had to step into the street sometimes to get around people. When I think of the Christmas spirit, you could feel it in the street. I don't know, it was just, uh, it, was a, it was a nice time. And downtown Haver was, uh, to me, and I think to most people of my generation, uh, it was where the heartbeat of Haverhill was. It was, I think, the big thing with the roads. And, you know, a lot of housing developments came in. You know, right after the Second World War, there was a lot, like Riverside, there was a lot of housing that were put, put in on, people, people got their loans on the GI Bill when they came out. A lot of what happened is when the money became available for people to buy a house, builders rushed to build housing and build single-family detached houses. And the idea of people living in a block in downtown Haverhill, for example, became um, not, not as prominent. People thought they would make it economically if they could say, I'm a homeowner. And that became one of the measures of social economic success for lots of people. And so the mortgage, that, the mortgage programs gave people the opportunity to get money that they wouldn't have had before. And developers were looking for large tracts of land, which historically were gonna be away from downtown Haverhill or downtown Lawrence or wherever else you look at in terms of this process. There weren't too many cars around in our time, so most everybody had to walk. Today, everybody has cars, so they can go everywhere. Back then, you had to go downtown. And that kind of dwindled away after the highway came through. That, that opened up in 64 in the city, so a lot of it just went outside of downtown. The second thing was at the end of the Second World War into the early 1950s, a major highway bill gets passed, a major significant piece of social legislation that builds the interstate um, highway system. Now with the roads they could live a little bit further away in one of these new housing developments and drive to work. Over time what began to happen is developers realized that as more and more people are living in so-called suburbs, if you start to build retail, commercial, and eventually office parks as well away from the downtowns but near to the suburbs you can actually meld the two, these two big changes together cars, transportation, people having their own homes, um, juxtaposed to an increased the growth of shopping malls, strip malls, um, and again, eventually office parks, which siphon even more work away from the downtowns. Nobody thought when that was happening, this could really be the ruination of my downtown. But slowly over time, that's exactly what happened. When the Methuen Mall came in, that made a drastic difference. Um, People liked the idea of, you know, being under, being out of the weather and, and uh, going from store to store. This was the change that the uh, town was going through at that time. Everybody was, you know, and was moving things out to malls, and this was the great excitement. And of course, everybody wanted to go there, but you know, 
With the advents of the plazas, it, it, it kind of drew <clears throat> the people to the outskirts. And with each of these plazas were a number of stores. Uh, there was a drug store, uh, a package store, gyms, pizza shops. So the need to get down to Mer Merrimack Street and uh, basically stop. So all of a sudden you had these new shopping strip malls, not really enclosed malls, but shopping centers popping up, which drew people away from the downtown, particularly with automobiles, because there was parking, they were convenient, and they were new, and new seemed to be what people were looking for. I rode down there quite often on my bicycle, even given the Main Street Hill and so on, there was so much variety down there, so much to choose from. Whatever you wanted in life was there on Merrimack Street. That went by the wayside when Urban Renewal came through. They tore down a lot of wonderful old buildings. Uh, the Pentucket Club is one that really bothered me. Uh, and the old City Hall was such a historic building. And um, City Hall, my mother used to drop me at the door and my Perhaps it was a water bill, I don't know, but she would make, tell me where to go and I would run in and pay the bill. And I remember being in awe of the building. It was beautiful. And as a little girl to be impressed by a building like that is amazing. The library, City Hall and the Pentucket Club were, were um, amazing buildings and, and landmarks in the city. And unfortunately, they're all gone. As more and more, mills left New England to go to the south and then increasingly the ones that were left started laying more and more people off. That the way that you were going to grow the city again, the way that you were going to try to revitalize the community in some way was to remove the history. Um, and so it was a very controversial sort of a thing but again in uh, you know cities around Haverhill as well as in Haverhill that's what happened. Tear down a bunch of mills, the hope would be uh, that maybe some high-tech businesses would move into that empty space and build a single-story building to assemble computers or whatever it might be. Uh, maybe some of it would be taken up with housing, but the idea was if you ride around every day and see the old history and the empty buildings, it discourages new private investment, it discourages new, uh, you know, people to come in and reinvest and do, do new things. And so a lot of urban renewal was that. A lot of urban renewal was tearing down um, city neighborhoods, um, clearing away several streets worth of wooden tenement housing, uh, old, you know, old blocks that had been mill housing because now there were no more mill workers. And now you've got all this housing that was dedicated to mill workers walking to work. Tear that down. And again, this thing, this all connects because the fewer people living in proximity to the downtown, the fewer people that are walking to Woolworths or Grants or the Five and Dime or the local barbershop or whatever it would be. And so tear down the housing, shrink the population that's living in the urban space, then the ripple effect is that the sandwich shop, whatever it is, has fewer and fewer people walking in. Simultaneously, more people are heading the other way to the suburbs. And so again, you've got this, you've got this perfect storm of, of retail fail. Probably the big problem that I saw was urban renewal with no plan, with no thought in mind as to what effect it would have. And then to, to uh, tear down a city hall, which today would be on the National Historic Registry, there was just no thought given to a good way to do it. Yes, do it, but do it in, in, an, in an intelligent and careful manner. The plan was tear stuff down and hope that some investor will come in. Um, but nobody ever, nobody had an investor in hand. Now I had a conversation on a uh, program I did with uh, the late Ted Pelosi, who was a mayor of the city and the city council, about urban renewal. And I said to Ted, so how come all of these wonderful historic buildings were taken down? And Ted explained to me, he said, the way the federal government was running the urban renewal program, it was an all or nothing proposition. You've either got to take it all down or you get no money whatsoever. But at the time, you've got a, a city that's got a 
dying shoe industry, the main industry is pretty much gone overseas or headed south, but it, it's gone out. Uh, you've got older housing stock, particularly down around Water Street, and you've got this wonderful opportunity that the government is dangling a carrot in front of your nose, saying, we're going to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars. All you need to do is tear everything down and then come up with a plan and and we'll give you the money to rebuild. And if you look at what was taken down and what was built in its place, it doesn't even come close. You look at the buildings that were erected as a result of river renewal, I call them 1960s ugly. And for the longest time, the property uh, behind the parking deck stood vacant. It was called the Dust Bowl because there was no plan to fill in. There was no architectural rendings. And so I think the urban renewal of Haverhill, if you talk to anybody in my generation or older, We'll probably come to the same consensus that it was probably one of the worst things that, that ever could have happened. Well intentioned, but when it went into practice, it just didn't work out the way it was supposed to. I was very happy to see the building gone. It had been an eyesore, it was in disrepair, it had trees growing on the roof. It was sad. It was, um, it was, it was sad to watch it fall apart. And it's sad for me because it was part of my childhood. And I think that lots of people my age and older remember lots of memories, have lots of memories about that building. And to be glad to see it gone is sort of um, a mixed message because while I'm glad that I have all those great memories, it was no longer the place that I remember and it was detrimental to the image of the city, and I'm glad it's gone. It's just too bad it came to that. Lots of so-called millennials, young people that have graduated from college, let's say in the last eight to 10 years, are actually beginning to live more in small urban areas, um, and that they're repopulating these places. And so that's definitely a trend. And they're also living in communities where there's accessible public transportation, which allows them to get, say, from this part of Massachusetts to Boston fairly quickly to go to work. And that's a trend, and that's a positive, and that's something a city like Haverhill can capitalize on. Speaking to people that, um, that I know, very excited about this whole project. I mean, uh, really, because it was a dead you know, dead downtown, basically. I mean, there were just a few things there. And now I think, you know, the people that I've spoken to feel, you know, sort of a, a renewed energy. I think that the new things that are happening are gonna be quite nice because uh, they started way up by the train station, so maybe transportation will pay, play a role in um, the future of Haverhill. I just think this is a real transition time for Haverhill and uh, I hope as a native that we can look forward not too distant in the not too distant future and see some wonderful things occurring and some more vibrant activity.